So good afternoon, my name is Robert Little, I'm the administrator for the Plant Industry Division of the Department of Agriculture. Um, today we are, is October 17, 2016, we are here for the workshop for proposed regulation amendments to Nevada Administrative Code Chapter 557, uh, this covers industrial hemp. Um, the scheduled time for this uh, hearing was 2 p.m., um, we are a little bit late because we had the prior one go a little bit long. I hope everybody is still able to attend. Um, this video conference is being uh, televised or um, re recorded and is uh, televised between the three offices that we have. We have the one we're here in Sparks. We also have uh, the office in Las Vegas. It looks like we have a gentleman there. And then we also have an office in Elko and it does not look like we have anybody attending in Elko. Um, this workshop has been properly noticed as required by the Nevada Open Meeting Law. Uh, the workshop is being recorded at all, and all attendees are required to sign in and those who wish to speak are asked to identify themselves uh, for the record. All participants are encouraged to engage in discussion, therefore there's no formal public comment period uh, during this workshop. Um, what I'd like to do to start off with is do some, just kind of some quick introductions, um, so we all know who's talking and uh, who, who uh, various uh, parties here represent, or if they just represent themselves. Uh, I've already done my introduction. Uh, to my left, if you would introduce yourselves. Jim Zhao, Nevada Department of Agriculture. Plus Wilhelm, Nevada Department of Agriculture. I manage the industrial hemp program in the state. And over to you guys. I am Becky Jesse, and I'm here on my own. Okay. Uh, Ed Chuck, I'm just an independent, sort of a novice farmer. Perfect. Michael Seibert, I'm with 374 Labs. We do a lot of testing for marijuana and hemp products throughout the United States. Excellent. And sir, your name in, in Las Vegas? Uh, Matthew Nelson, I'm a horticulture technician at a, a medical marijuana facility here in Las Vegas and uh, just a cannabis fan seeing my, my uh, opportunities here. So. Fantastic, Michael. Uh, very nice to have you. Um, so, Matthew. Matthew Nelson. I'm sorry, Matthew, I'm sorry. Um, Everybody has seen the sign-in sheet. You guys will need to sign in as well at some point. Make sure you sign in. Um, and Matthew, did they provide a sign-in sheet for you as well? Yes, sir. Perfect. Thank you very much. So um, just kind of an overview of uh, what, we, what we're looking at here. Um, this is a, just a, a very short uh, amendment to uh, NAC 555, which is where our hemp regulations live. This is more of a clarification, uh, if anything. Um, I'm going to read the amendment actually because it's so small I don't have to go through pages of it. Um, this is to amend an application previously submitted pursuant to section 5 of this regulation, a non-refundable amendment fee of $500. Uh, the other fee due uh, pursuant to this section will be adjusted to reflect any changes in their certificate and the certified, uh, in the certified and registered site. Um, essentially what this is is um, and so does, is every, I guess to, to start this conversation, does everybody understand how the industrial hemp program for Nevada works and um, what the application, why we require an application and then why then we're uh, looking at an application amendment for the, for a, an amendment to the fee, uh, amendment to the application fee. That part I don't, I don't know okay. why you're, you're requiring an amendment. And so the reason why we're asking for the amendment to the, to the fee is more of a clarification. Um, every time that anybody, and so you, you have to understand uh, just kind of what we see on our end when it comes to applications. We received uh, quite a few applications for uh, industrial hemp. This, this, this year was our first year, as I'm sure, I'm sure everybody here knows, uh, for Nevada to have an industrial hemp program um, based off of the 2014 Farm Bill um, and then accepted in, uh, what was it, 503? Uh, what was the 305, 305 um, Senate Bill 305 um, that we would, would participate in research and development programs throughout the data. Uh, we received a, a, a number of applications um, and if you've seen our application you understand our application is very, um, uh, has a lot of information to it, it requires that you, you, you submit what your research program would be uh, all the way down to uh, variety, the varieties that you're going to be growing defining the acreage, uh, where that lake, where everything's going to be grown and everything yeah, else. very specific. Yeah. Right, and so I'm covering for everybody, not just, <laughs> so it's very specific and there's a, a lot of information that goes in there. Um, upon receiving uh, the first round of applications, um, which actually take quite a bit of time for Russ, uh, who runs the program, to, to go through, uh, it's quite a bit of time for him to vet everything that's in there, to make sure that everything that's there is correct in nature. 
Um, so he has to verify that all of the addresses are correct, that everybody is in, you know, uh, um, that uh, all, all of the, uh, the varieties that, that people are looking to get are correct, the acreage is right, that the GPS port is correct. Um, the, uh, so and, they need and to be audited. It's not that they need to be audited, but they need to be, they need to be that. And so he received um, quite a number of application um, um, amendments uh, directly after he uh, everybody submitted theirs. Everybody wanted to change everything on their applications. And so uh, going to where the site locations were going to be, who the uh, intended parties were that were going to be receiving seed or who were going to be growing seed. They wanted to move it to a different site, a different location, different varieties and everything. And so all of those, for all of those different things, it took quite a bit of time for him to actually go back through, compare it to the original application, look at the new application, and then vet all of the new information that was put on there. And so for those, for those reasons, that's why we're looking at now having an application uh, amendment fee. Because it essentially is a brand new application. What, what spurred the, so many changes? I mean, was it, was it a, a why did so many people just change their minds? And, and Russ could probably answer that better than anybody. He's the one that looked at all the different changes. I mean, it ran from A to Z, but if you yeah, want to just quickly. So, Russ Wilhelm, the back of back, the record. There were numerous variables that came into play as far as what uh, surged our, our need to incorporate this newfound fee with our uh, administrative code. Um, Looking at the applications, processing the applications, submitting um, certificates to all my producers after those applications have been processed is a very lengthy, rigorous task. Um, once a certificate is sent to the producer, it has a lot of specific attributes on it, including uh, varieties to be used, uh, geospecific information as far as lab long, um, acreages to be in production, things of that nature. Um, individuals within the industrial hemp realm of this past season decided that um, there were also a lot of variables on their end. So some people would submit an application with, a, with an intent to farm one specific field and two months later they would change their mind because they lost water rights or they um, didn't actually get full uh, approval from the owner of the land, they didn't own the land. Yeah, so, so it kind of jumps down a little bit. Exactly. So this is more, show, more so to ensure that the individual or the entity submitting an application will have all of their ducks in a row and will have a concrete idea before they submit an application. Okay. And that's all it, all it okay. is. So it's an avoidable fee, like I said earlier. Okay. So if you have everything accounted for prior to submitting an application, you'll be well off, you'll be fine. Are those the applications public information? Uh, you submitted applications? Yeah. They are. Uh, we can be FOIA for them, absolutely. Information. But, and the and the um, the licenses um, given awarded however you word it um, those are also for we can know who those growers and so forth are. Public information. Absolutely. Yeah, public, First okay, okay. Because so, I don't know where to find it in the labyrinth of. So so my intent with that I know there's a lot of interest as far as how do we access um, information as far as who's growing currently how much acreage is in production. My intent is to wait until the end of the season because things within farming alter quite a bit. I mean, one person will put in 40 acres and then they'll lose 30 of it and only have 10 actually in production. So I'm waiting until I get final uh, harvest reports from all my growers this past season and then I will publish that on our website for everybody to access that way. Um, our, our growers are also required to submit um, a research style document um, like you would do say for a college thesis or something of the sort and submit that to the department, I will review it. And, um, it's, it's supposed to be a comprehensive document that showcases their successes, their failures, identify um, struggles with the industry, a lot of uh, agronomic uh, practice sell, um, verbiage, things like that, and those will go online as well. Good. That's all good. So I'm not led to believe that if we fill out the application for the certification, it's not going to be fee. And if we don't get everything right, then we have to come back and amend it, and then another fee. Well, if you look at Russell, for the record, um, if you look at the actual proposed statute change, you can see that there are exemptions. So things like address changes for like a business address. That, that's not actually the farm that. What's on there? I don't have the application in front of me. Uh, um, you're talking about just the language? Yeah, we put an exemption in there. So if you would alter your phone number or something of that sort, that's totally fine. You're not going to charge a $500 amendment fee. 
Um, so, let's see. I don't leave a lot of things questionable on the application. So, so I mean, there's, so on the application, the way the application looks, there's sections on the application, section one, two, three, whatever that you got. Um, some of the applicants, some of those sections don't require a fee change. Um, and so if, if you as a, as, a, as a grower change your phone number and you're giving us a new phone number, that's not going to require a, a, a change in that. But it, it's, it's, when it comes to substantial information on changing the, the, the amount of acreage that you're planting, where you're actually planting, the different varieties that you may need, if you're changing those types of things, that's where it's going to be uh, required a fee. Well, then I wasn't able, able to select the variety I'm going to change. I'm waiting for more information. That can have some guidance, and now so I have to more or less leave it blank. Now I'm going to come back and I'm going to decide finally what kind of variety I'm going to do it once I order my seeds. Now will that be a, will that be an amendment and a cost so, structure associated? Without with knowing without knowing what variety that you're going to be ordering, why would you submit the application for beforehand? I understand the whole. Thing. And I I can see that as well. Uh, within the application, there is actually a checkbox that says to be determined amongst the seed. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you can checkbox the to be determined because we realize that yeah. things within the seed importing business are very, very, very fluctuable. So you can checkmark to be determined, and then we can figure out exactly where to source your varieties from at a later date. If you specifically put on there that you want three varieties from Canada, and then I go for the night. <laughs> process for the DEA and I develop import permits for that specific seed and then you go and change your mind and I, I have an import permit out there with the DEA and we're trying to import 3,000 pounds of a specific variety and you change your mind you don't want to do it anymore then I'm not prepared to have a battle at that point. So it's more of an accountability fee um, and an insurance fee to, to make sure that you are actually willing and you know what you're getting yourself into as far as the well, Also, once you file application and you're certified is that good for an annual period, or you have to do it every year? Brand new. Yep. So, so each certificate has an expiration date on it, oh. uh, and from date of file with us, you have one year to cultivate a harvest and do everything in, in yeah, the spectrum of industrial and cultivation. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That's not to say if you have industrial hemp product, um, say fibers or textile or something laying around, you can't still sell that. But it's basically going on, on the on the planting and the growing season of what you uh, brought in on, on the seed. So we don't want people bringing in seed, holding on to it for a whole another year. You know, I, I planted half of it this year and they're holding on seed. Because for the DEA, you're not allowed to hold viable seed. Um, the grower is not. Um, and so it needs to be sowed, it needs to be um, sowed into the ground. It needs to be planted. And so that's why we put it at a year uh, uh, timetable on that. And so if you can't plant all of that seed, um, uh, we, we we would like to see everybody plant the seed, but if you can't plant that seed, we need to be notified of that, and then the, we we would take custody of your seed and hold it, or it would be destroyed one way or the other. How how we want to go about doing that? I mean, that's something that we would have a discussion with the grower. Yeah, I was, I was thinking more along the lines of, of, of producing the food products from the seeds. So once you've harvested it, and so if you're going to produce food product from the seed. If you're gonna, uh, and I never get, I can never say, it's a word that just gets stuck in the ear. No, the ir irradiation. Oh, ir irradiation. Irradiation, I can not say that word. If you were to have irradiated, irradiated and made it to a uh, seed that was not viable anymore as far as uh, reproduction, uh, you couldn't replant it, then you could hold the seed. But if it's a viable seed, um, the uh, the grower is not allowed to hold that seed. So if it's processed, and if it was a processed seed at some point, if you, if you were to you know put it through some type of a processing to make it unviable, then yeah, you could hold on to it. But if it's viable seed, the grower's not allowed to hold on to it. Okay. For the DEA. Yeah. Len Hetrick, Department of Ag. Typically, if you harvest seed, you're going to press it or you're going to do something with it which renders it useless for planting. Right. And because they, as you know, consider it still to be cannabis. Yeah, but you have to process all the seeds and not hold it and all this stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's, there's, a, it, there's a huge gray area within what DEA says in regard to seed. It, it, they, it has, when it's imported, it's supposed to come through us. We have to inventory it. We have to account for every single pound, every ounce. He has to weigh it out to individuals. They have to accept it. At, I mean, they consider it to be a Schedule One drug. So when you try to hold it, it becomes, unless you're going to press it, you're going to irradiate it, you're going to cook it, 
you're going to do something to it to render it useless, they consider it to be a Schedule One drug. But it, the, the thing seat. is, it, you kind of throw away the potential treasure to throw away your seat. If you have a seat from a particular year, you know, you may have something that is quite unique, and if you have to destroy it or utilize it for some food or whatever, you know, and that kind of goes contrary to the to the the whole concept of saving seeds. Why save seeds? Well, you never know. Exactly yeah, and, what you and, want. and you're right. And w th this is what I said about being a total gray area, yeah. because there are states that are transporting seeds between them. If you ask the DEA, they'll tell you that you can't do that. Mm -hmm. It has to be imported seed. They want to see it. They want to count yeah, for it. it. But there's yeah. states doing it. We've had other people ask us if they can actually import clones like they do with cannabis. Yeah. Whether you clone a product, you, cl you, know, you cut clippings and you bring the cloned clipping that's growing in a plant, in a little planter, you bring that in. Theoretically, that can't be done, but it's being done. <laughs> so the feds can't make up their mind how they want to regulate any of this. And we're stuck in the middle trying to stick with the rules they tell us mm -hmm. we have to do. They're up their mind very soon either. Yeah. No, and they're not going to do it quickly. And, and this is where this, this becomes such a nightmare for us, is because every time something changes, we're back to having to satisfy the DEA. And they have to they're count the seeds and well, how come a guy took this many pounds and why didn't he, well, what happened to that? You said he planted 40 acres, he's only got 10. And we're going through this, we had, I don't know if they told you, and I'm sorry, I gave him late, but they had, a, they had a grower who applied and Russ has to go inspect every one of these. And he goes out to inspect and it turns out that the, that the uh, proposed grow site is a home in Summerlin, in, in one of the high rent gated districts in, Las Vegas. Yep. I mean, these are, and then the guy says, well, it turns out that I can't plant here and I'm going to move it over there. Well, you can't move it over there. This is all accounted for. It's in a certificate. You can't just up. We had one person who said, well, I'm going to let three of my friends grow it for me. No, you can't do that. This is all controlled. He has to inspect every single location. Well, it's pretty clear on the application. And yeah, it's absolutely. It's still there too. Yeah. <laughs> initial throughout all those policy clauses, yeah. but they will not handle the product in any fashion that's not legal as per the DEA. So, transporting seed to somebody who's not authorized by the state is legal and it's probably going to be a federal offense. You know, but we get it all the time just because these people have been. So well, you know, I mean, they can go chase after them. Yeah. I don't know about any of you guys. Well, well, they will because we're periodically supervising this and overseeing that it's being done correctly. Oh, and, and before I was like, it you said be, it would be here and it's well. Exactly, there, and, and he like, has to actually test it to make sure it's less than 0.3 THC before it can be harvested. Oh. So he has to know where the field is. And he has to be able to test it. And, and, right. and one well, of the this bigger... is the whole point, right? I mean, this is part of the point of having industrial hemp in, you know, growing in our state and so forth. To say, look, this is harmless. This is useful. Yes, exactly. You know, we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot no. by being, you know, tripping over our own. Yeah. One of the bigger issues, though, that comes in with all of this is. If we don't follow it to the T, it puts the whole program in jeopardy. Okay. And so that's one of the reasons why we have to make sure we vet all of these applications or, or, or the, an amendment to an application so much because if the DEA comes in and they determine that they don't, they don't like the way that we run the program, they can shut us down and it puts the whole state's program in jeopardy. And so for that reason, we're very cautious about how we look at these applications and everything else. And so getting back to you know the reason for the, the, this, this change is to make sure that we have the, the, the resources and the time that allotted to go forward and, and look at these amendments properly. And so that's why we're here today. And this is, sorry for Las Vegas, uh, Matthew, uh, this has been a very um, North-centric uh, conversation. And I would love for you to, you know, if you've got questions or concerns, to be able to address them here. Is there anything that, in particular that you'd like to discuss um, that we, we haven't touched upon at this point? Not at this time, i sit on and see his opinion and went on. I've got. Hey, Matthew, I think you're covering the speaker with your hand and we oh. can't hear. Can you me now? Yes. Yes. You just need to push it once and then it'll it'll stay on. There you are. All right. Okay. Uh, no, I don't have any questions right now. I love the uh, I love the conversation and uh, your your guys' question. I just really wanted the feedback and know what's going on in the hemp industry, you know, in Nevada being already in the uh, medical marijuana scene. So 
I really don't have any questions, honestly. Uh, I, if I did have any questions, it would be probably from like a veteran standpoint. You guys uh, have any, I guess, uh, incentives for veterans to get into this in industrial hemp industry, or? No. And Lynn Hedrick, no. Department of Ag. No, we we don't have any programs to promote this. We're we're in the uh, unfortunate business in some ways of regulating it for pursuant to the federal law. So. We don't have funding or anything to promote this. The funding that we have to operate the whole program comes off these applications, and that's it. So there are no incentives or anything that we can offer to promote hemp. We, we love it. We'd love to see it do well. You brought up a very good point. We'd like to see it be an economically viable crop for right. Nevada farmers, and we'd hope that it uses less water. It's part of what Russ mm -hmm. is following. If it will do some of those things, it has potential to be a boon to Nevada agriculture, and that's what we're after. We we just have to do the business part of it, and we, we're a fee-based agency. Everything we do has to be covered by a cost that we assess to somebody. And because this is a, a, a state's rights um, uh, program, the state has the ability to you know enter into these things and, and not approved by the federal government. Unfortunately, at this time, uh, hemp or medical or recreational marijuana can, do not qualify for any subsidies uh, given by the federal government. Um, and so, uh, or, you know, we, we, we handle a, a program here at the Department of Agriculture called the Specialty Crop Block, Specialty Crop Block uh, Grant Program. Industrial hemp and, or any cannabis does not qualify at this time because it's not, it, it's not federally recognized as, as a one that can do that. And that's where that federal funding comes through. So, unfortunately, right now there just are no subsidies for veterans right. or for any special interest group at this time. Mm -hmm. It's just it's it's a research and marketing uh, you know opportunity for states to get involved in, and hopefully at some point down the road the federal government will make up its mind on what how they can yeah. classify cannabis. And so, well, if cool. I could add something uh, down here in the uh, marijuana scene, it seems like. Uh, it's a lot of uh, connected people that got the, the lottery, uh, the plan that they had for the businesses. I hope that doesn't go on in the hemp industry as well when it, when it fully uh, opens up. We should. So, um, you know, love to talk all things hemp and, and everything else. We do have another um, um, workshop that's going to be starting at 3 o'clock, so we've got another 10, 15 minutes or so. Uh, I'd love to talk him with everybody else if you, if you like, but does anybody have any issues, I guess, or suggestions on the uh, proposed language? Um, because that's what we're here for right now is the proposed language. And then if not, we can spend the last 10 minutes of, of, of this allotted time to talk, you know, just generalities of him if, if, you, if you'd like. Generalities? Of, of the program we're what, Okay, and what... Uh, but before we get to that, I just want to make sure we've we, we addressed everything that we're here for on, on this workshop at this time. Just that, that change in, in language there to clarify on the uh, amendment to applications. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to okay. go from Vegas. I understand it. I'm just... Uh, they they got to they stick to what I is on the on application. They can't be resubmitting. Exactly. All the time, yep. because yep. this is a total bottleneck situation. Correct. Okay. All right. And we've had a couple of these that have changed four or five times. Uh, I know. Matthew, thank you. Easily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, so an issue is that it's a domino effect almost where somebody sees that it's a doable process where they can alter their application and it goes through and we approve that altered application and I think they can just keep altering it. Well, yes, yeah. I worked in tax accounting. You want to talk about amendments? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, okay. if anybody has any questions as far as the general scope of industrial hemp, where the program's going, uh, what's currently in operation, mm -hmm. if you want to get into the industry. I just don't understand an, an adjusted fee. I mean, what does that mean? Robert, can you hear Elko? We can, thank you. Is everything okay in Elko? The, the yeah. adjustment. Uh, for, for him? For this hearing. For, for the hemp hearing? We have seven hearings. I'm just trying to figure out which one they're for. Okay, this the one he's here for is the pesticide, the pest control operators. That one starts at 3 o'clock. He's more than happy to sit in for the rest of this hemp one, but that one will start in 10 minutes. Okay, all right. Thank you. Thank you. The, the adjustment fee, the question you asked, me. it says the other fees due pursuant to this section will be adjusted. If you read down in three and four, there's a fee per acre. 
and a free or a fee for 33 cents per thousand square feet, depending on what you're planning. It means we'll adjust that accordingly. So if you were to, let's say you came in and you said you were going to plant 100 acres, your your application would be $500 and your fee would be $5 an acre or another $500. If you came back to us and said, well, I'm going to amend the application, I want to change it to 20 acres, we, we charge you $500 to amend the application, but your $5 per acre fee would drop to 100 bucks, not 500 bucks. You'd save $400. Yeah. Or you, 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 the adjustment would be to reflect what you did in the change, is all I'd say. And I'm oh, trying okay. to discourage oh, okay. people from constantly changing their information, right. just, you know, that's all So these are fixed fees, and you adjust relative to those. We adjust the ones that are adjustable on acreage if you, you change it out. If you haven't paid enough, then you have to pay more, mm -hmm. uh, based on these two things. But I thought maybe you had, if, you know, like, I'm trying to decide on the variety to buy, and if I can't specify right now, if I change that variety because it doesn't make sense, you know, is that, a, would that be an adjusted fee? It's just a specified fee. No, 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 no. The determined box will allow you to do that. The issue would be more that if you said, I'm going to plant 100 acres, and then you came yeah. back and said, no, I've altered it, now I want 500 acres, and I want to change the variety after I told you what the variety is, and I want to change my research yeah. uh, or goal as well, and I want to take half of it now and press it, and I want the other half to be made flour out of so I can cook cakes out of that and see if it's economic. I mean, those are the kind of changes that kill grass. He's having to de detail and document all of this for the DEA. Okay. Okay. Uh, this is a little yeah. right there. Now, there's no <laughs> adjustment just because we say, well, we're going to adjust the fee because you decided to change no, it. I understand, I understand that. It's perfectly logical. Yeah. I have a question. What's the cost for testing Sampling and testing. Cost for sampling and testing right now, those are all going to be determined by the chemistry department that we hold here at the, the state um, HQ. And um, those are yet to be determined. Has there been testing done so far? Absolutely, so yes. Just haven't been built yet? Or? Yep. Okay. We're building the materials for a chemical analysis at this point. Um, we are actually looking into that probably on Thursday. <laughs> We're going to develop our fee schedule for um, specific THC concentration analysis. Um, and we're going to develop methodology to um, allow for one standard method to be used every time. That way it's always uh, concrete mm -hmm. in that manner. This, is, this whole thing is kind of in the embryonic stage. Oh, it is. I mean, yeah. you, you're really, you know, you're, you're on the grassroots part of this. So Absolutely. thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, yeah. so currently, um, so really, I mean, I, I, I realize you, know, you need at least one or more seasons to really feel like you're gaining mm -hmm. some ground. Um, so everybody who's out there doing it right now, um, it, they're kind of in their experimental stages as well, right? Yeah. So we're all pretty much there's babies. A, there's there. a massive realm of limbo around industrial hemp right now, especially yeah. in the state of Nevada. So uh -huh. um, we're starting to kind of just now merge out of the water and figure out exactly how to cultivate in the proper manner, how to get seed in the proper manner. Everything in the whole entire slew of the industry is sure. being figured out to make sure, it more sure, efficient. Sure. So Trial and error. Exactly right. Yeah. 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 So um, that's that's definitely the uh, the running trend for this season is trial and error. Uh -huh. uh -huh. it, 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 and it's not, a, uh, it's not an appropriate time to judge um, success or failure because you're just, you're having nope. to work out these Yet. So to say, yeah. uh, um, do you have any one in particular that maybe you have your eyes set that these people look like, hey, they're, they're kind of doing a good job, they have a good chance of, of succeeding? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, there's several within, within the industry right now that have some variant of success associated with their cultivation. Yeah. Um, people have sold their crops or it's people... Um, have had full scale 50 acre production. That's but if you haven't done testing yet, I don't understand. We've done testing, we just haven't done feed. Oh, you just haven't built for the test. Correct. Right. Have all tests been compliant with the point three? All of them except for one. Mm -hmm. And it came down to chief chemistry in the Department of Agriculture. We just developed the method and then we, work, we tested over about 20 samples. Where about the 20 samples? Yeah, 20 samples. So far, is the most of them is below the, the level of THC 0.3%. So for what? the test, 
schedule and the fees, we are still discussing with uh, Russell, and we see how we go. And that matter is not. It's fully divided and uh, validated by the line. So you are ready to go. So we have the ability to test, we have been um, conducting tests uh, on a consistent basis. It's just a matter of we haven't built any producers, and they're full well of that. So they go well enough of that. So. What's the highest CBD you see in a sample? So we don't look at CBD in specific. We typically run an analysis. It's not of interest. Yeah, to you right. Right. It's it's just just the federal requires 0.3 THC. Right. Yeah. With, they don't care what with, CBD is. Yeah. Yeah. With HPLC methodology, you can't determine CBD. Yeah, we, we have to do everything for the interaction of the that. You know they have CBD, CBN. But for the particularly for the industrial hemp, we are not doing that yet. We're still working on the THC also. Do you guys have a protocol for ensuring like a representative sample? I and mean, how much do you collect out of a certain crop to make sure it's representative of the entire? Yep. So I I built the standard protocol in order to uh, administer an ethical um, representative sample from each individual field. Is there a certain percentage then that you're trying to? No percentage. I do a specific uh, defined quantity from each field. Uh -huh. Um built within a representative region of that field. And I've seen a wide scale of different field operations existing from six plants all the way up to oh, 10,000 plants easily. You know? and, um, I, I've standardized it to the point where I can get a representative, representative sample from each field using the same methodology. So um, I get the top six inches of the plant, and I get 10 samples from each field. I mix that together into a homo homogeneous mixture, and, and deliver that to the lab and analyze it um, with their own specific SOPs. So uh, every field is sampled in the same exact manner. Is there any way you'd be able to share that protocol? Probably, yeah, I'm going to have to. <laughs> absolutely. I'm just, I'm just interested. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So it's the top six inches of the flower you mature female plant. Okay. It's just going to be where the highest concentration the highest of the PhD is going to be found. That makes sense. Absolutely. Okay, so um, how do I access the information of the people of your uh, research that are doing well and that show good signs of success? I mean, so yeah, like I said earlier, you can wait upon my, my publications online or you can go forth and you can contact me and okay. um, I can contact the producer and see if that's okay if I provide immediately their information to you mm -hmm. and you can access it from them. And, and everybody's been pretty... Uh, mutualistic as far as yeah. sharing information goes because it's a research and development program and people are well in the know of that, so they want to provide as much information as possible to allow the industry to prosper. Because if we don't see success all throughout the matter, then ultimately we're looking for failure. Yeah, yeah, I know so. you want this to succeed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we are kind of promoting the industry as far as regulating the industry right now just because we do have a regulatory program and that's the only way that this program can exist. Right. So I think that that in itself is, is doing really well for the state of Nevada. Um, the fact that we can actually operate the industrial hemp scheme, right? So, mm -hmm. it goes well. Yeah, there are a lot of states that don't have any hemp programs. So. Uh huh. I know. When I was uh, basically, I was double checking um, a friend's information, you know, and I was just doing my own research because, you know, I want to just call people out on there. And, you know, so I'm researching the information and reading, I'm just getting more and more information. And it's like, check to see if Nevada has it. And I'm like, bing! <laughs> there must be something. Yeah. There must be something. So I'm very, very interested. And uh, I would be very interested in helping you with maybe you need help processing your stuff. I would, I would really like to talk to you about how I might be able to help you. Really? Yeah. yeah. I'm always open to comment. Yeah. Um, do you have staff that helps you um, process the stuff that you have to do? <laughs> yeah. it's a man. You're it. You're in. Yeah. You are in. Absolutely. You and are we in. operate with, uh, throughout the entirety of the state of Nevada. So north, south, east, west. I'm, I'm there. So you've got the research goals as well to make sure that they fall within the program guidelines? Say that for the sure. research goals for each project? You, did you approve all of those? Yeah. Well? Yep. We read through everything um, very lengthily and rigorously, and we determine if they're going to be fit for the program. And uh, it's very difficult because there's a lot of suspicious characters that operate with that throughout the industrial life spectrum mm -hmm. right now because they're all recreational marijuana values, you know. So it's difficult to, uh, to improve. Um, I mean, 
it's hard not to discriminate, so we don't discriminate. So we, we look at an application, and if they have some viable um, intentions for research, then you're probably going to get approved, um, because we want to see as much research done as possible. And are, are they being held accountable for actually doing that research? Yep, Is there any, absolutely. So they potentially, if they don't go through with some of the research, they wouldn't be able to be approved for the next year? Yep. Is that how it works? It, it, it would depend on what the issue was. We've got several stands that were pretty poor, and people said, this isn't economically feasible for me to continue to water. And they plot it down. They're not doing a research right. project because they have no crop. Yep. Uh, and, and there are others that perhaps when, when they thought, I mean, some of these things are not things people can control. They thought they were going to be able to, I'm just going to pick one. They thought they were going to be able to press it for oil. And when it came time, if they weren't, it wasn't economically feasible to get some place to do that. So, I mean, we're not going to punish somebody right. for trying to do the right thing and it didn't work out. But yes, they are responsible to do what they are supposed to do. And one of the things we asked most all of them to do was to try to keep track of the water. Because the water is a huge issue for us in the state of Nevada. And if we <coughs> grow something with less water, it means a big, you know, it's a big deal for us. I was just at the plan meeting today about that very subject. About the water. About the water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, we need to end this. Yeah, uh, for going over into the next uh, uh, scheduled workshop. Um, if there's any other questions, I, I know Gus, you're you're not in on this next one, probably. Are we going to discuss test set application at seat? We are. I'm going to take that out of turn, and it's going to be the last one because four o'clock. Well, whenever PCO finishes, okay. because there was nobody that showed up for that hearing, we opted to move it further down the agenda, okay. only because there wasn't anybody there and we have one that's pulled over. So we will be back in on that one. Okay. So at 3 o'clock, which is, we're already over, is the scheduled time for the um, uh, one for pest control operators. So uh, if anybody else has additional questions uh, on just general oh, camp, uh, Russ will probably be out in the lobby and you can, you can speak to him on that. But I do have to close this one, adjourn this one at this time, and we'll be starting the next one here momentarily. Thank you, everybody who Thank attended. You. We really do appreciate it. Scott? Yes. Hold on one second. Um, I got a question for you, but let me stop this one.